Hello and welcome to another edition of Mosaic, an African-American perspective. I'm your host, Deborah Milo. October is National Domestic Violence Awareness Month, and my guest today is Debbie Feinstein, Chief of the Special Victims Division at the State's Attorney's Office. Debbie, welcome to Mosaic. Thanks for coming on today. Thank you so much for having me. It's mm -hmm. nice to be here. It's good to see you again also, by the way. <laughs> Great to be here. I want to talk a little bit about, before we really delve into the subject matter, talk a little bit about and share with our viewers how you came to be to do this type of important work. Sure. So, um, Deborah, I supervise the Special Victims Division, as you mentioned, which um, encompasses prosecution of domestic violence cases in our county, mm -hmm. um, as well as child abuse, elder abuse, um, human trafficking. And I've always just been drawn to cases um, that, and to to situations where someone is disempowered mm -hmm. and um, is put into a vulnerable situation and taken advantage of. And I've just been drawn to that since mm -hmm. I was in high school and on my Paint Branch High School mock trial team <laughs> and uh, in Burtonsville. So I, uh, yeah, so I, I just, I've been drawn to it and I feel fortunate to be able to work in this field mm -hmm. and to, you know, try to make a difference for people in our community. Let's start talking about um, a lot of folks don't really understand what domestic violence is. Let's talk about a basic understanding of what, what it is and how, how it manifests. Sure. So um, domestic violence, you hear different terms uh, mm -hmm. used for the words, used for domestic violence. You hear intimate partner violence. You mm -hmm. hear dating abuse, different things. Really, it all comes down to two people that are involved in a relationship um, that, and regardless of gender, age, I mean, this happens with teenagers um, and uh, who may be in a dating relationship. And really, it's about one of the partners mm -hmm. controlling the other one mm -hmm. um, or attempting to control the other one. Um, and whether that's through physical means, emotional mm -hmm. means, verbal, financial, sexual, it can take all different um, forms. Right. Um, and, but it really, it all comes down to sort of that basic power and control um, yeah. paradigm. And see, that's, that's where it gets, you know, that's where it gets ugly. You know what I mean? It gets ugly. Talk about a little bit about how the state's attorney's office fits into the whole spectrum of domestic violence. Sure. Um, so my division in the state's attorney's office mm -hmm. um, prosecutes any case in the county that um, happens that's a criminal case, that's okay. a assault or a violation of a protective order. Um, but really, we're part of a much larger community um, within Montgomery County that not only handles the criminal justice side, but okay. also tries to provide services and offer help to victims and families that are dealing with domestic violence, and also to direct uh, people that are finding themselves in the position of the abuser to intervention programs to mm -hmm. get help and support that way. Mm -hmm. um, my boss, John McCarthy, is incredibly committed to fighting know, <laughs> domestic yes, violence is, um, uh, in the community and really just getting out and, and speaking and, and having opportunities like this to speak to the community about what the resources are that are available. Which is vitally important to this to this work. Absolutely. What are some of the other agencies that you work with you were talking about? little? So my division is located at the Family Justice Center, mm -hmm. um, which is essentially a one-stop shop for victims of domestic violence in Montgomery County. Mm -hmm. And we're co-located with the Sheriff's Department, the Police Department, um, and uh, an organization called Safe Start, which provides counseling for That's kids right. that are yes. exposed to domestic violence, yes. uh, Catholic Charities, who helps provide immigration mm -hmm. um, services, uh, housing opportunities, there's Career Catchers, which helps build uh, with careers and resumes and scholarships and things like that to help victims and families move through. And so really it's a, it's a place where there's wraparound services. Mm -hmm. So that's, our off, my office is there and we work with families that come through there. Um, and, but we also, we're just one piece of the puzzle right. um, in terms of wanting to help people heal and, and move forward. But a very significant piece of the puzzle to say the least. I want to talk a little bit about, and this is where we get into when I said ugly, when we start talking about the ugly aspects of this because it's all ugly, but the, the hope is, of course, is the healing part of it at some point. Yes, of course. Talk <clears throat> a little bit about why victims stay with their abusers. So I think there's some statistic or study that was done that it takes right. someone seven or eight times, that they will leave seven or eight times from their abuser before they make the final decision to leave. Mm -hmm. um, and if they, if they ever get to that point that they make the decision right. to leave. But in, in cases involving intimate partner violence are very complicated because of the intertwining of the relationship, whether there's children, mm -hmm. lives intertwined, finances that are intertwined. Um, one person may be heavily reliant on the other for um, everything. Right. And that's part of how the power and control dynamic is set up. Mm -hmm. You have one person who may be providing the money, the food, the child care um, expenses being covered, and so the other person literally can't survive without them. Exactly. So they're going to take whatever 
is doled out to them, essentially. Right. right. Um, so that's how the dynamic takes root. And you know, the frightening part is, is that, like you said, the, there are children that are uh, many times a part of this process, which is so frightening. You know, can you speak a little bit about some of the types of services that you have for kids too? I wanted to ask you that earlier. Sure, and again, it's it's not it, it's not my office specifically. It's really right. part of this collaboration with the Family Justice Center, right. and the services that are offered through the Family Justice Center are, are offered through this program called Safe Start, mm -hmm. um, which offers direct services to children and their families who mm -hmm. are exposed to domestic violence or who have experienced it themselves. Mm -hmm. um, and it's 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 counseling. I mean, it's it's providing therapeutic services to help. Um, kids um, sort yeah. of contextualize, understand what's going on, and hopefully heal. So how do the behaviors of the abuser affect children? Significantly. I can imagine. Um, mm -hmm. Significantly. In fact, a couple of years ago, the Maryland legislature passed a law enhancing the penalty uh, if someone commits a second degree assault mm -hmm. in front of a child. Mm -hmm. um, the penalty is uh, enhanced. It can, you can serve more time if you commit the crime in front of a child, um, of a cr crime of violence in front of a child, um, because of the recognition of the long-term detrimental right. effect that that has on that child. It's not just in that moment, it's for the rest of their lives. What are some of the signs and the, or the evidence of domestic violence? Because you know, sometimes it's emotional. As we've read before, as we've, you and I have discussed this before. Mm -hmm. What are some of the more outward signs that people can, people you know, will see? So first of all, someone who is in a relationship where they're experiencing domestic violence yeah. will often go to great lengths to hide it. Um, and to cover up and to make it appear as everything in their life is normal. That everything is okay. That, that everything is okay. Is wrong. They're fitting into society. And it's, yeah. Exactly. Um, because a lot of people and most people experience a lot of shame and guilt um, yeah. around this issue and if this right. is what's going on in their family and also feel like maybe their fault, which it is not, let That's me right. say clearly. Thank you. Um, yes. And uh, so, really, some of the signs, so the things to look for, I think, are. Some, say, say someone, and let's sort of liken this to someone gets in a new relationship, mm -hmm. um, and suddenly their patterns begin to train, change dramatically. Or even someone that's in a long-time relationship, and their patterns change dramatically. They used to come to play cards once a week um, with you, or be in a book group, mm -hmm. or um, you know, for teenagers, be involved in an extracurricular activity. And they're suddenly withdrawing and doing things different than what they had done before, right. or withdrawing and not doing social things that they might have done before. Um, all maybe you know, in the guise of, I'm in this new relationship, I'm going to spend all this time with this person, right. but you have to be careful because so we, the power and control dynamic can end up taking over and part of it is also isolating the person that's being victimized um, so that they really feel like they don't have anyone else to rely on except for the person that's abusing them. Um, and so they end up withdrawing from their friends, withdrawing from their family, and those are things to look out for mm -hmm. in terms of the emotional or the verbal abuse. Um, and obviously you can listen in on conversations, but a lot of time an abuser is not going to reveal that side of themselves in front of others. They're going to save that That's for the true. privacy of the home mm -hmm. and the privacy of when they're just with the person that they're manipulating. So it's about that one-on-one -on -one control relationship. And just like you said, Debbie, uh, it's all about disempowering that other person. Absolutely. You know, taking taking this the power away from them so they have absolutely no control of their lives. Yes. And see, that's the frightening. That's another frightening part of it. Yes. Talk a little bit about what some of the things that you've seen in your career and working. Uh, working with the, uh, the state's attorney's office. Sure, I will. And, and you know, I, I just, before we move on to that topic, I want to mention, you asked about signs. The obvious signs are physical. Right. Um, and it may be just, again, as basic as watching someone, you know, wear a turtleneck in the summer or long sleeves mm -hmm. um, or wear a hat or dark mm -hmm. sunglasses. I know that sounds sort of, in a way, cliche. Um, but it's But true. it's true. It's true, right. <laughs> it's true. It, what, it's what happened. I mean, I've talked to many survivors of domestic violence, and they would describe the lengths that they would go to to cover up their physical injuries or the excuse uses they would make mm -hmm. about taking a fall or banging into something or having some sort of accident that doesn't quite add up. So that's another sign to look for is mm -hmm. to sort of evaluate, you know, wait, my friend's not really accident prone. Why are they suddenly taking all these falls? Why am I noticing scratches and bruising? Why am I noticing that someone's, you know, co-worker's missing an extraordinary amount of work in a way that they weren't before or periods of time, you know, mm -hmm. around uh, you know, three days in a row here, three days in a row there, and they come back, they don't look quite the same. They don't act the uh, same. They don't act the same. Mm -hmm. They may be withdrawn. Because um, really a lot, of, a lot of victims of domestic violence are, are hiding what's really going on. Um, because that's, again, part of that is that's what the abuser wants them to do. That's exactly right. And see, that's what, so those signs are the things that we need to be aware of. 
absolutely. Know, be cognizant about and make sure that we pay attention. Absolutely, absolutely. And to be available to listen and to hear um, and, and to know that you know, if, you, if you're suspecting something's going on, to make yourself available to listen. Um, not yeah. to tell the other person what to do. Exactly. Um, in fact, it's kind of counterintuitive in some ways. You know, you, I, I always say to people, and this is this is really from a clinical perspective, not my personal uh, personal perspective. But you don't tell a victim to leave their abuser, because if you, as the friend, come in and start dictating to them what That's to do, right. you're just supplanting sort of that power and control relationship exactly. and they're not uh, they're not going to respond well to that. I mean that's sort of documented and studied. Mm -hmm. Really being there to support, to listen and to know what services are available to direct your friend, your family member to um, is super important and in our county we're so fortunate yeah. to have free services at the yes, Family Justice are. Center that are anonymous and confidential and people can take advantage of it um, you know every day of the week. Now let me ask you, I'm, a, I'm, gonna, I'm gonna twist this just a bit. Sure. Do the abusers show any so kind of signs, outward signs that maybe you or I, the average person, would notice? I know that's kind of a... So, I mean, it's a good question. Um, yes and no. Mm -hmm. I mean, I think it really, really varies. Um, mm -hmm. You know, certainly we see, you know, we can see if we're with friends or with family mm -hmm. and we see outward signs of aggression um, or things that are being said that don't quite yes. add up. Right. Um, or things that are demeaning or belittling, um, putting someone down. Again, saying things that are dominating or controlling on a routine basis. Look, everyone says things or does things, you know, that That's aren't right. appropriate right. every once in a while. Right. Um, but I'm talking about patterns, systemic situations where you're watching a family member or a friend just get put down all the time. And you know that that's not the person, that's not, you, you know that that's not what that person should be receiving. Absolutely. Well, no person should be well, put down that exactly. way. So, um, so again, it's about intervening in a way, not not to say, what the heck are you doing? Why are you with this person? Or why do you have this new boyfriend that's so mean to you? Mm -hmm. It's how can I be there to support you? You know, it seems like things are hard for you. Um, you know, I, I saw, you know, thus and such saying X, Y, and Z to you, and you know, it made me a little uncomfortable. Right. Um, you know, I hope you're doing okay. Please know that I'm here for you. That's important, Debbie, and I'm glad that you said that. Before we go to break, I wanted to just make sure that I had a chance to introduce you again as Debbie Feinstein, and you work with the state's attorney's office, and you are responsible for domestic violence abuse awareness, correct? Correct. Okay, then. For those of you who've just tuned in, you're watching Mosaic, an African-American perspective. I'm your host, Deborah Milo, and I'm talking to Debbie Feinstein from the Montgomery County State's Attorney's Office. After a short break, we'll be back with more about Domestic Violence Awareness Month. Welcome back to Mosaic, an African-American perspective. I'm here with Debbie Feinstein with the Montgomery County State's Attorney's Office. Debbie, I wanted to go back to the one uh, subject that we were talking about, about the work of the State's Attorney's Office. Talk a little bit more about that. Sure, so um, within the division that I supervise, we have specialized prosecutors that handle cases involving domestic violence. So we really treat these cases with special care and I'm make sure. sure that we're not only prosecuting the case but thinking about what outcomes are going to make sense both okay. for public safety and for this family. Mm -hmm. um, and we try to look at each case individually. Mm -hmm. um, and, uh, and we see all sorts of things and from everywhere in our county, everywhere in the community, it cuts across all racial, socioeconomic, right. um, religious lines um, in yes. our county and really across the country. And we know that you know one in four people in our community are affected by domestic violence directly. One in four? One in four. Mm. One in four. Mm -hmm. And we also know that that's not the rate of reporting, so we're right. just seeing the tip of the iceberg. Right. Um, and really, we try to do take a multifaceted approach in addition to our criminal prosecution. Mm -hmm. We also try to do a lot of prevention work and get out into the community and teach about the signs and teach about what to look for and what to do if you or a friend is in trouble. So that's why Domestic Violence Awareness Month is so important. So important. 
Yeah. Uh, talk a little bit about what kind of activities, if there are activities or things that are going to be happening, how you're working with the marketing to be able to make people more aware. Absolutely. So um, this month, uh, the county executive is launching, and with the Commission for Women, launching a public information campaign yeah. on domestic violence prevention, coming that. to a ride on bus near you, Absolutely. and to bus shelters, and other information to be distributed. But all around the year, we have information throughout the county on the backs of doors in libraries and uh, and in mm -hmm. courthouses and in community centers. Mm -hmm. We have uh, cards in five different languages with resources listed on them. We try to distribute our materials far and wide. And then we obviously have our website where you can come and get information. Um, really, there are, um, there are many ways to access information. And as I was mentioning earlier, right confidential, anonymous, and we can try to structure the access of that information, accessing that information in a way so that the person that is in the uh, abuser's seat right. doesn't know that you're accessing the information. And we do everything important. we can oh, to, protect, yes. um, to protect the victim in that way. And see, that's what a lot of people probably don't know. Yes. You know, because, you know, all you hear about is the, what's happening with the victim. And the victim, of course, can't go to, may not feel as though they can go to a, a, a neighbor or another resource without their abuser knowing. Right. And I think what's also important for people to understand is that the services in Montgomery County, there are free services. That the Family Justice Center is centrally located. It's by a metro. It's on the bus lines. Mm -hmm. But they also have um, taxi cab service. So that, and we have programs set up to get people to the center if they want to be transported there mm -hmm. and ways to set up things again in a, so that can can uh, coordinate a safe situation mm -hmm. for them rather than um, exacerbating a dangerous situation that they may be in. How can we raise more awareness? By talking about the issue? And see, by doing what, this? That's what we don't want to do. You know, yes, many communities, you know, including communities of color, have certain traditions. It's not something you want to talk about. Yes. You know, it's not something you want to talk. You and I talked earlier about um, understanding that it's the quiet, it's the, the shame right. that's part of that. Talk, expand about that a little bit. Sure. Someone that is experiencing domestic violence in their life um, isn't necessarily going to want to tell anyone about well, it. Course, because, right. Well, not only, not only because they're ashamed of what's happening to them, mm -hmm. but because the abuser is telling them they're not worth it. I am the only one that is going to love you. Um, you are basically worth nothing if you're not with me, and you need to do this, or mm -hmm. um, you know, or you'll be alone for the rest of your life, or whatever, whatever controlling language right. it is. Um, playing and on the fear, playing on the fear, you right. know, or people um, in relationships, uh, abusive relationships, use threats uh, related to immigration status in order to try to control the other person. I will report you to INS or to ICE if you don't do X, Y, and Z. Um, I will tell your employer X, mm -hmm. Y, and Z about you if you don't do blah, 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 blah. Of course. And so more it's, it's control. more control, threats, coercion. And um, you know, again, regardless of what's being said, there is a path to getting out of that. Of course. There is a path. It's not an easy path, but there is a path and there is support. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So as community members, like you said, talking about it, bringing it to the forefront, bringing it to our, you know, uh, religious institutions even, I would think. Absolutely. You know, having people from your office come and talk to various organizations. Absolutely. And um, my office, in connection with the Domestic Violence Coordinating Council, mm -hmm. we go out into the community, we do programs, we offer programs for schools, for community groups, really anyone, churches, uh, mosques, synagogues, anyone that will hear us we can come and run a program for. We can do programs for, directed at teens. We can mm -hmm. do programs directed at adults. We can do programs directed at parents. We can do train the trainer and teach oh, youth yes. service providers how to, to, to offer programs to kids. Basically, if you can conceive of it, mm -hmm. we would offer it um, and be able to provide education and prevention tools mm -hmm. um, for people in our community. I was just this morning at an event through the public schools, through Montgomery County Public Schools, speaking to um, uh, people that are involved in nonprofits and community organizations and right. MCPS, again, telling them the same thing, um, that we will come, we will come to the classroom, we will come to the, the church group, to the youth group meeting, whatever it is. Mm -hmm. um, and when I say we, it's not just my office, it's a right. collaboration of all of these amazing organizations in our county um, who will come into your community and bring the programs to you. That collaboration is so important because- It's key. It's, yeah, it's the way that things are gonna get done. I know that you've seen a lot, a lot in your time, you know, in, in your work, but I want to ask you, what positive things have you seen? Have you seen some healing take place? 
Ab absolutely. I love that. Um, absolutely. I, I mean, want there's. You to talk about that. Sure. Um, someone that can come out on the other side of this mm -hmm. and feel stronger and, in some ways, come alive again and be yes. out of that, out of that dynamic of power and control, and know that they're in control of their life and their destiny is huge. Um, particularly from for someone. I mean, I've dealt with victims, men and women, who have been totally not only physically beaten, but also mentally beaten down oh, yes. to feel like they're basically worth nothing, that their life does not have value. And to sort of bring someone into the light and say, you know, this is just not true. We need to shift this paradigm. We need to turn this on its head mm -hmm. because you are worth everything. Absolutely. Um, and I find it incredibly inspiring. I mean, I work in a field that's, that's difficult because of the oh, subject yes. matter. Yes. On the other hand, I am thrilled to come to work every day and have the opportunity to try to do justice, to make a difference, and to prevent these crimes from happening before they happen so that more families are not affected. Um, and that's why, again, thrilled to be here today to talk about this issue. You said something key that uh, that sparked my attention. You said men and women. Oh, yes. Now, see, typically you wouldn't think that men uh, experience a, a domestic violence as the a person being abused, but it does happen. One in seven. One in seven. One in seven. My goodness, and do they have the same types of, I guess the question is, same types of syndromes, if you will, Yes, that yes and no. I mean, again, every case is unique, and of I guess, course. you know, I, I talk about sort of these broad categories of what you see. Every situation is different, mm -hmm. but, and, and you may not see, if there's a physical disparity in size, you may not see physical abuse quite as frequently in that True. one in seven. When I say one in seven, or I say one in four women, it's not just the physical, but the emotional abuse, the verbal abuse, the psychological abuse can be just as devastating in terms of your feeling of worth you know, and, mm -hmm. and feeling okay about mm -hmm. sort of walking, you know, on your own feet every day. Um, and so, yeah, no, it affects everybody. And it's in all types of relationships. It's not, you know, it's heterosexual, um, homosexual, right. transgender, whatever, whatever. It is consistent and the numbers are consistent across the board that mm -hmm. it affects communities one in four, one in seven across the board, regardless sort of of where you fall in, in, you know, in terms of your type of relationship or your, you know, your economic situation and that sort of thing. It affects everybody. I think that people also, also don't realize that it affects our economy as well. Can you talk a little bit about that? Sure, of course. Um, I mean, the, it can affect our economy in different ways. Right. Um, so I think, first of all, the, the health consequences that can come to someone that is victimized by domestic yes. violence and that family and sort of what results. There's all sorts of, um, obviously, not only mental health, but also physical, physical health problems health, that course. result from being uh, uh, being in an abusive, controlling right. relationship. Right. Um, decline of health, um, physical, mental. Um, so that's an impact. Also, ability to work, ability to contribute that's to society, right. um, ability to get up out of bed in the morning um, and be, you know, be a part of the world. Those are all things that get affected because someone can be so literally mentally or physically beaten down that they're unable to sort of be a part of the rest of society in a contributing way, and that's not that's not good for our economy. Clearly, no, it's not. Um, and uh, and the financial abuse in and of itself is really a category of domestic violence, and it's a reality. It's Very a reality. I, you know, I can tell you um, a story about one woman that I worked with actually an elderly woman who actually she'd probably kill you kill me if I said elderly a lovely lady who uh, <laughs> who uh, who was in a situation where she was in her second marriage and her husband used to leave her um, a essentially a allowance every week on top of the toilet seat um, and, and that was her spending money yep that was her spending money and it was she didn't really understand until after he unfortunately perpetrated a very serious act of physical violence on her, sort of what all those signs were. Nothing physical had happened in their relationship. Um, there was, he, he used to leave her the money. He used to, he, he wouldn't allow her to buy any clothes on her own. He had to observe everything, you know, go to the mall with her, pick out her clothes. Mm -hmm. um, he didn't allow her access to the credit cards. Um, and, and then one day he ended up shooting her. Um, and there had been no other physical violence, but there had been all these little signs of control, and she didn't even realize it. She didn't even realize that she was withdrawing from her church groups and her community mm -hmm. um, and, and really getting very focused on this relationship only because that was part of the cycle. And see, she didn't see that coming. She did not, and she... She still, to this day, I'm sure, would not like to be called someone that was, you know, I, I call her a survivor of domestic violence, and I think yes. she's amazing. And for her, this is still, it's, it's shameful. Of course it is, and I understand that. I yeah. really do. The work you do is positively amazing, and we are so fortunate as a county to have you and the rest of your team here. It's just amazing, and I'm so glad that you're here. 
Thank I you really so am. much. Thank you for having us. You know, we'll have to have you come back to talk more about this very important subject matter. Absolutely. Unfortunately, that's about all we have time for today. I'd like to thank my guest, Debbie Feinstein. For more information, visit MontgomeryCountyMD.gov backslash SAO. I'm Deborah Milo. Please join us again next month for another edition of Mosaic, an African-American Perspective. Till next time, make it a positive day.